this is actually inspired by a GitHub project, uh, Haiku Finder. Um, so we'll be, yes. That's the same guy again. Is it really? Yes. Yeah. Jonathan Feinberg again. Wow. wow. Let me know if he's, uh, he's around. That's, that's great. <laughs> he works at Google down the street. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and what you, you described it a little bit differently. It actually finds haikus in the text. So it right. finds strings of text that will have the proper syllable added. R yeah. That, so so what this that that program actually does that. This one will actually it does a little. It, there's a little twist to okay, it. Yeah. So if it doesn't find that, you know, what can we do with that? Okay. Um, so we'll be kind of uh, re-implementing certain parts of this. Okay. So for this one, you'll actually need the NLTK contrib package from a Google code. Um, I didn't see it on the actual NLTK website. Um, so if you go there, if you go to uh, if you type in NLTK Google code, you'll actually it should be one of the first ones that pops up. So remembering this whole uh, URL. Um, if you go there, it's, it's a bunch of uh, uh, user contributed packages that are outside of the, the core LTK package. Um, and you will also need the WordNet corpus as well as uh, CMU dict. And again, these are um, these are corpora that you can download using the ltk.download function. Since there was a question earlier, WordNet unzips to 36 megabytes of data on disk and CMU dict is almost 4 megabytes of data. So it's not so bad. And that's, that's total, so it's, yeah. Yes? What happens when you run these analyses over scientific papers? Um, actually, that's one of the more popular things that they, they usually use this for. Um, what, uh, what happens to it? Yeah. Uh, does the analysis uh, work well? I think I can answer that. A little bit, a little bit be a little bit more specific as far as, like, um, <coughs> do you, extract of the appropriate hypomins, hypernims, and uh, all of the different elements? Are you able to extract oh, oh. Cell of similarity between two scientific articles yeah. uh, sufficiently well that it's actually usable? Um, yeah, that's actually interesting you bring that up, because I know, uh, especially scientific articles and papers, generally can turn, uh, it has a lot of specific uh, language that you may not find in WordNet. Um, so what, do you, what would you do for something like this? Well, essentially, probably the best thing to do there is look for co-locations. So if you see a lot of uh, words that are appearing frequently, basically consider that something of importance. Or if you see words that, that um, are not found in a certain uh, um, corpus, you can actually consider that as a significant word that belongs to this category of text. And we're actually going to go through one of the last examples is will actually be a spam detector. And uh, I was, this was an example that I previously used to actually classify documents coming in from Wikipedia. So it's, it's a very similar thing. So um, you can detect plagiarism? Huh? Can you detect plagiarism with this? Plagiarism? Um, maybe, maybe it would be used for something spe as specific as plagiarism. I mean, plagiarism is basically, you would basically just compare text and see you know, how similar they are. It does give it a score of similarity. Yeah, you can do that. You can gen definitely generate indexes of similarity between two documents. Um, but I mean, you wouldn't, need, you wouldn't need the aid of NLTK, I don't think, for something. Okay, so we're going to start off. We're actually going to, from the NLTK contrib package, um, we're going to import the English syllables um, class. And we're also going to import from the corpus package, we're actually going to import CMU dict and WordNet. Um, and we're also going to import Word tokenize. So these are basically the quotes I decided. I mean, I basically put together a bunch of, uh, bunch of quotes the series of twos quote, this one, as well as a few Bushisms. These are, I mean, take your time to read this because these are funny. He didn't say this in one speech, by the way. These are two separate events. So. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do is um, we're actually just going to create a a string of tone. We're going to fill that up later. Uh, create a list called word map. And we're going to tokenize this entire, uh, this text chunk. And you'll see that a lot of these processes actually always begin with tokenizing it because that's the easiest way to kind of separate out the words and, and deal with, uh, you know, kind of deal with each word individually as well as the word that came before and after. Um, we're going to go through each one and uh, 
basically, if it's if it's not just a, if, if it's not a, if it's alphanumeric, we're gonna add it to our word string. This depends on word. Oh, sorry. We're just gonna append a space to the end of it. And using the syllables, uh, the English syllables class, we're actually gonna get a word count, or we're gonna get a count of the syllables within that word. And this is kind of automated. I'm not really sure how it works on the on the back end of it, but all I know is that it gives you, it's pretty accurate as far as uh, the syllable count for any given word. And then we're gonna finally gonna append it to our list called word map. <coughs> okay, um, actually, that's explained so much. Word map, by the way, we're appending it, we're appending a tuple, and uh, the tuples all contain the, the actual word and the syllable count next to it. So here we're going to actually define a function that is a kind of a fallback, and that this is kind of going back to uh, what you had said earlier about you know it actually finds it in text. Well, this basically doesn't go into the text to to find uh, certain patterns of words that occur, like you know a current sequence like a haiku. What this does is it, it just starts from the beginning, goes all the way to the end, and as soon as it encounters something that is not of the right syllable count, we'll throw it into this function, um, which will try to look through WordNet and kind of give us a uh, Another word that has a similar meaning that may fit this syllable count. Cool. Use the uh, Python term for that. The Python term for that. In the very beginning, there were this very there were, there were three terms that, that define the words of a similar nature, and then the words that contain other variant and hypernet. Right. But like we oh, uh, yeah. This. Yeah. This. This is definitely. Let's see, what do I have to use? I use well. I use lemma names actually. So lemma. So something that is that is similar, but is uh, a descendant of. I mean, uh, yeah. So for each one in this one, we're actually going to get the synset of that word. You would pass it into here, and so this function is actually going to return a word that has again a tuple that contains. Uh, well, it's actually it's going to return the word and the syllable count of that word if it matches. Otherwise, it's just going to return the same word you passed in. So it's not going to work 100% because you're not guaranteed that if it goes into WordNet that it's going to find something similar. But, I mean, it's it's good enough, I would say. Okay, finally, this is actually... It's actually getting smaller. Yeah, it's getting very small. And this is because this is not the best written function uh, on the planet. So <laughs> I wrote it very quickly and uh, it's really... A, it's a, this is actually the abridged version, too. So you're very lucky to see it this large. <laughs> but it's on, it's on the website, and uh, I think you guys will pretty much all be able to write it much better than this. But uh, basically, we just loop through each one, keeping a tally of you know what word we're encountering now and how many syllables it is, and then decide to break the line or not. And in the end, uh, it's again, it's not perfect, but it's pretty cool. And on the right, you'll see those are actually the syllable counts for each line. Where, which of these had a replacement word? Um, I was thinking of implementing that feature where it would highlight that, but I didn't. So unfortunately, this one, I have no idea. We could, we could go back and prepare, but I think that would just take too much time. All right, so let's build something even cooler. OK, so in this final one, we're actually, I was thinking, you know, we'd, we'd go through and do something, create something that's more commonly seen and used in a lot of places actually is uh, text classification. So the spam filter that we're going to be writing is going to use some classification techniques. It's going to categorize things uh, and it's only going to have two categories that it'll put them in, either spam or not. Um, so basically once we write this program, given any, any email it should be able to uh, correctly categorize incoming text as spam or not spam. After you train. After you train, right. 80, 20, 80%. We're, yeah, we're actually going to go through and look. You're going to see, uh, I'm going to actually talk about that later. Um, so what you're going to need for this is the stop words corpus, um, LTK, obviously, and um, a good data set of emails. And you need both spam and ham. You're also going to need patience. Um, these programs, especially during the, the training process, and it, it tends to take a lot of time, um, especially if you have really large data sets that you're running this against. Um, a note on this good data set of emails is that it's usually hard to find ham 
emails because nobody really wants to expose their uh, personal emails for the benefit of you know science and technology. <laughs> so what we do have though is uh, all of the Enron emails um, that have been made public <laughs> because of the scandal. Um, so uh, this contains both spam and um, ham. Or we could use our own emails. Corporate ham. So it contains very specific words, you know, specific to what Enron kind of dealt with. A lot of uh, energy. And you can just take it. You can read it. I mean, there's, there's, I think it's uh, 200,000 emails that are exposed. So this is actually a pretty big data set. Um, and also, this is one of the most popular data sets used in training uh, uh, spam classification software. Basically, it, it, it is completely legitimate, you know, and this is actual emails that people send back and forth. And there's such a large quantity of it. I don't, I don't think Enron liked all their emails can be exposed. Oh, no. No, they definitely didn't. <laughs> that was <laughs> it's a dumb question. Is it all in English? Um, I believe so, yeah, yeah for the most part. The, the, uh, the yeah, yeah, I believe, yeah. I mean, the spam is like, I, I don't know what language they come in. You can take a look at it, so, you know. Uh, but the, the ham, I, yeah, for the most part, I've browsed through um, a lot of it. And it seems to be mostly English, yeah. So that's the link right there. It is kind of lengthy, and for that reason, it's, it's probably best to wait till I upload this later tonight to my site to actually go there. But it's, um, we're going to be using these uh, zip archives located at that site. Um, each one contains, it's already contains two folders that have sp uh, both spam and ham. And you could basically extract that and get started with this one. Actually, if anybody's actually copying this down right now, is anyone? Google has it. Oh, okay. So yeah, Google has it as well. And I'll, obviously, this isn't the only data set of, uh, of Enron emails. You can, there's a lot of sites that host it, and, but this is the one that I found is already pre-formatted for how we're going to use it. You can actually, as we go through, you can, over here, you can actually create your own directory, spam and ham, and get this data set yourself and just throw the emails in the appropriate folder. Um, so, what we're going to do is, if you, if you use that link that, that was provided in the last slide, um, you can just extract that archive, um, and you would extract it into your working directory. So you'd have your script, and then you would have a folder, ham, spam, contains the appropriate emails for um, each one. And um, down here, we're going to start actually importing different things that we need. So we're going to import, uh, again, word tokenized, um, wordnet lemmatizer. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, of how we're going to use that. Um, and we're actually going to import our classifier. And for this, we're going to use a naive Bayes classifier. Um, it's a pretty, pretty standard classifier. There's more advanced ones that you can use. In fact, the documentation has a whole host of different uh, uh, classifiers, but a lot of them require a lot more fine tuning and uh, several more parameters. But this is very simple to use. Um, so we're also going to import the classify module, and uh, you can ignore that last one that's being imported, max and classifier. I actually don't use that during the program. Forgot to take that one out. Um, <coughs> we're going to import this corpus called stop words. So stop words are essentially words that are rubbish. I mean, in any given piece of text, there are certain words that you don't need, like the, can, will. They're not keywords, essentially. Um, that corpus is, is frequently used. I, I frequently use it myself. Um, it's useful for things like if you, if you want to create, let's say you have people that are making blog posts and you're just looking for the key terms in it, uh, you would begin by cleaning that 